Thank you everyone for joining us for our 2022 Community Voices Poet Speak program series. Today we are featuring poet Shah Noor Hussein. My name is Nia McAllister and I'm the Public Programs Manager at the Museum of the African Diaspora in San Francisco. As we begin, I invite you again to share in the chat where you're joining us from. Though we're gathered virtually, I want to acknowledge the spaces that we're occupying. We recognize that non-Native people to this land are descendant from settler occupiers or descendants of those forcibly brought to this continent. Moad occupies the unceded land of the Ramatash Ohlone people. We pay our respects to the Ohlone people and their elders, both past and present, who have stewarded this land throughout the generations. We encourage everyone to learn more about the native lands that you occupy by visiting nativeland.ca. Community Voices Poets Speak is an annual series that features local Bay Area poets sharing original work based on the current exhibitions on view at Moad. Today's program is the fifth in the seven week series with each Tuesday featuring a new poet at 5 p.m. This is their opportunity to share new work and reflect on the inspiration of the exhibits and process of writing ekphrastic work or poetry based on or about art. The current exhibitions on view at Moad are Soul of Black Folks by Ghanaian painter Amako Buafo and Thread for a Web Begun works out of Silk by Malawi-born Johannesburg-based artist Billy Zangewa. As we adapt this program virtually, we'll be sharing images from the exhibitions throughout the program. So you'll see those images on the screen as Shaw shares their poetry. I encourage everyone to engage throughout the chat, um, write any lines that stand out to you, any observations that you'd like to share. And then we'll have time for a short Q&A at the end. So please do think of questions that you would like to share with Shaw. I wanna thank poets and writers for supporting this program series. So today's featured poet is Shah Noor Hussein. Shah Noor is a writer, visual artist, and scholar crafting narratives at the nexus of Black feminist thought, queer diaspora studies, and liberatory pedagogies. Shah's poetry has been featured in Foglifter Press, the LA Review of Books, Umber, Kanja, and they have performed at the Museum of the African Diaspora, at Diaspora <laughs> Asharo Ekendayo Gallery, Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive, and the Black Joy Parade, just to name a few. Shaw works as managing editor for the Arrow Journal, a publish, publishing scholarship at the critical nexus of racial justice and spiritual wisdom. Welcome, Shaw. Thank you, Nia. I'm so excited to be here. Um, a little nervous, but definitely holding um, space and warmth and gratitude for all of you for making it. Um, as Nia so eloquently introduced, my name is Shaw. My pronouns are they, them. I'm an artist and a scholar. Um, I create work around themes of diaspora, memory, nostalgia, abolition, desire, erotics, so on. And uh, there are a few things I wanna share before I begin. Um, I'm definitely like, definitely in professor mode. So just a little precursor, little lecturette from me. Um, so of course, first and foremost, I'm speaking to you from the unceded territories of the Chechenyo speaking Ohlone people. Um, you can find out more about the history of this land through the websites that I'm gonna drop in the link. Uh, one is for a women led native um, initiative that rematriates lands in the Bay Area, the Sogorati Land Trust. And then we also have a website that I'll be dropping in the chat for the Confederate villages of Billy John. So check that out to increase your native awareness. Um, so secondly, I wanna speak a little bit to my positionality. Um, as a person, as a scholar in the diaspora, as an artist in the diaspora, I'm here in the States largely due to military dictatorships in my home country of Sudan. And those dictatorships continue to terrorize and displace people to this day. Um, in fact, it's been 108 days of revolution and unrest in Sudan since the latest coup in October, 2021. Um, 108 is important to me because it's a sacred number in Buddhism. It reflects a number of principles um, the number of distinct feelings and emotions we can express, the number of beads on a prayer necklace, the number of sacred texts that Buddhists study, the number of questions asked to the Buddha, and so on. So um, I came to this awareness of the importance of 108 through Alexis Pauline Gums's work, as well as through a study of Buddhism. And so as I learned from Alexis chanting 
quotes from Black feminist theorists and scholars as a way to empower ourselves. I pray that today the number 108 does something for Sudan and that maybe if you have a moment to chant for freedom uh, for the fighters out there, for the freedom fighters, maybe so. And if you would like to find out more about what's happening in Sudan, you can check out this website, sudanku.com. Okay, and the last thing that I wanna say um, is to wax a little bit nostalgic and think about the first time that I read at the MOAD, which was in February, 2020, when I was invited to be an open mic feature. And it's important to me because it was the last public event I attended before pandemonium. And life was so different before this pumpkin patch that we're in. And, um, you know, will it ever be the same? I just, you know, we were less than 90 days into the first revolution in Sudan at that time, which was the first one in decades. And if you had told me that two years later, uh, we would be here on Zoom, not in the gallery and um, things would be happening the way they were, I would, I would have said you lie in, but here we are. <laughs> And honestly, I am though, I'm, I am really glad to be here and to be rocking with the MOAD. And I'm grateful for all of you who have shown up um, and who've made it here too. And in honor of all the people who haven't made it here, who weren't able to be here today, who even wanted to come but didn't. And of course, all the folks we lost recently and distantly to the freedom fighters on the front lines from Sudan to Palestine to Oakland and beyond. I just wanna give a moment to them. And um, I wanna say before that moment that there are black people in the future and that we are some of them. And uh, may it be so, may it continue to be so and just let's have a moment of, of silence. Okay. So to the poems. Uh, Nia, you can bring up the slides if you'd like. Thank you. Thanks everyone for being with me here. Okay. So a note on my methods because this is the first time I've ever worked with ekphrastic poetry. Um, and it's, you know, in response to the artwork um, in, in a moment of intentional conjuring, I'll say. And so I was really inspired by the work of Tina Camp. Um, and she has a recent book that came out that's called A Black Gaze, currently on loan from the Library of Shaw. So I can't show it to you, but what I can show you is uh, listening to images by Tina Camp. Um, and so her scholarship, which has spanned decades, um, really has inspired the way that I look at and critique and think about and talk about visual art. Um, and she has like a multitude of methods and um, theories. And so I really encourage you all to just like get a black gaze or any book from Tina Camp. And um, I'm gonna just type her name in the chat. Um, and, and think about that. But the one thing that I will say that I took and I applied in this method was um, what she did in the black gaze, which was when she went to studio visits, she would sit down in the studio or in the gallery, like on the floor and really like be with the work and take notes about how it felt, her surroundings and her interpretation of the work. And then she would use those notes later to write her papers. Um, so this is me in this photo looking at uh, Vincent Miranda's work, Florida JIT. And after this photo was taken, I did sit on the floor. Um, and then when I went to go see Billy Zengewa's work, I sat on the benches, I had my notebook and I took a lot of notes. Um, so yeah, and to continue just to speak about uh, my methods a little bit, um, I took notes, I wrote, did a couple of free writes in the spot at MOAD. Um, I returned to those pictures a few times. I, I took reference photos actually of all this work and some of them are in the slides. Um, I returned to those photos later on after I left, jotted more notes. If, if more came, some whole poems came, I let that happen. I did try to look back and sit and edit um, and clarify, which is usually my process, but um, it also happens when you read out loud. So that's a big part of it for me. So largely a lot of this is actually unrefined and unedited and unclarified, which leaves me feeling a little vulnerable and open. And I hope you all hold me delicately in that process. Um, yeah. 
So you can go to the next slide, Mia. Thank you. So my first um, poem is inspired by Florida Jit by Vincent Miranda. It's uh, the Emerging Artist Exhibit on the second floor. And um, I did live in Florida for some time, although I don't claim the state. My parents live there now. Um, and this experience in the exhibit definitely gave me a vibe of swampy days and humid nights. Um, and that's where this poem comes from. You can actually go to the next slide also, Mia. So this is the swampy days, humid nights vibe, uh, video installation on the wall and some um, really delicate, intricate pieces of art with, with texture and sweat beads and mosquitoes and flowers and skin. It's really good work. Um, and so my poem is on the next slide and I will read it now. It's called, What is a Jit? What is a Jit? A disembodied grin sits in a face framed in flora and dripping sweat. Mosquitoes swarming, a gesture, captured. What does it mean to be a nigga with confidence, a young brown boy peacocking, a soft nigga who likes flowers and records bird songs and films sunsets? What does it mean to steam up car windows on summer nights Breath meets sticky air meets sticky fingers meets wet lips meets. What does it mean to be a jit in a country full of niggas, a drop in a sea of diaspora when black already always is more? Thank you. And uh, this slide, I wanted to y'all to see, this is the most refined poem of them all, the format. It was not intentional, but if you like step back a little bit and you squint, it's giving vase, right? With flowers, <laughs> it, the, the format sort of mimics art. Um, so I was pleased with that. Thank you. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So uh, the remainder of the poems I have are in response to Billy Zangewa's work, uh, which I really took a lot of time in. Um, yeah, stay until closing. And um, I, I include some of these bigger photos so that you can see how the images are placed together, um, these beautiful fabric works, and then also I have some close ups. So you can go to the next slide, Mia. Um, so this first photo um, includes a piece that I'll be talking about soon, which is Mood Indigo, and it's like the one farthest on the right with the blue background. Um, and what I was looking and learning about Billy Zingewa, I was, uh, I learned that she was a mother and that this influenced like a lot of her work. And so I started to think about my own home spaces as a child and my matriarchal lineage. Um, and this is what it brought up for me. So you go to the next slide. Uh, this is on the left is um, part of the home and on the right is mood indigo. And this is poem number two, uh, which is currently untitled. My mother decorated all of our living rooms with burgundy couches. Over the years, the walls and cities changed chaotically, but the tiles were always white and the seating red. In my twenties, I visit my haboba of my own volition and I sit in her saloon on the women's side where the chairs feel like thrones framed in gold painted paddling and carved curved woods. I take her portrait on my last day, admitting that I'm trying not to cry. She remains stoic for the photo, but her voice breaks after. As she begrudgingly acknowledges that she will miss me despite my oddness, her implied undertone is loving sternness. Years later, in longing memory and lingering nostalgia, I revisit these photos in isolation, hoping to see her soon in the summer. I notice again the gold framing on the couch and allow my eye to follow the curves to the fabric and find its burgundy. I realize my mama never left my Habuba saloon and neither did I. She took it to every house, painting it gold and burgundy, sun and blood, and so do I. Thank you. Oh, and Elizabeth, I just saw your comment um, in the chat. You know, he reposted my story. Vincent Miranda reposted my story. So, you know, I do think you also would like the poem. Um, 
Thanks, everyone. Okay, we can go to the next slide. So this is uh, the framing, the context for the next poem, uh, which is afternoon, which is modeled after afternoon delight, which is this one on the left on the red wall. And you can go to the next slide. Um, so when I was looking at this piece, um, I, I was also recalling that one of the panelings um, included a description of uh, Audre Lorde's erotics as being one of Billy's inspirations for the works that she created. Um, and if you follow my work, you know, I always be talking about Audrey. Audrey inspires me a lot too. Um, she also inspires Kaguna Mashiria. So Audrey Lord is a black feminist uh, writer and scholar and a beloved ancestor. And Kaguna Mashiria is a living, breathing uh, diaspora scholar, independent scholar from Kenya. And he writes a lot about Audrey Lord and he writes a lot about Claude McKay, who's a Jamaican author. He wrote Banana Bottom. They all write about erotics and intimacy and lots of stuff like that. And for me, when they all come together, I start to think about um, intimacy and grief and erotics, uh, sensuality and sorrow, and just, it gets smushed. Um, so that's what this poem is an experiment in. This is probably the roughest one. Uh, it's not even typed up, it's right here in my notebook. And um, yeah, it gets interesting. So it doesn't have, well, I guess, uh, if there's any PG-13 ears, like, or below in the room, you know, just giving you a heads up. There's profanity in this one. Okay, so um, it's called I Fucked Myself Last Night. Okay. I fucked myself last night in the name of Belle and Zora and Audrey and Tony and Habola and Billy because they would have wanted me to feel pleasure. At the end of a morning and a long day of mourning, I would like to think that Belle would have said, you go girl. And Audrey would insist that my erotic power is mine to hold and wield as I see fit. And my Haboba would thank me for accessing the joy that she was denied. And Zora would have hooted with laughter and Tony would have smiled fiercely. And maybe after I came and maybe after I cried, Billy would weave me into a fabric and stitch me like this afternoon delight. And maybe it would always remain impartial, a fragment, incomplete. Maybe because it was already always too much. Maybe because blackness and grief is always in excess. Maybe because grief and intimacy are two, two very different black holes, holes. And yet I find myself often in both Maybe because blackness and grief and intimacy are incapturable, not completely, in any medium, and that's good. Yeah, that's good. And at any rate, you'll catch me drenched in light, framed in red, and resting. Thanks, y'all. I'm not sure where I'm gonna like end that one. There's a few endpoints, you know, like what is my fifth exit to be determined. So there's a few. I'm glad you liked that last one, Eva, drenched in light, framed in red and resting, because that one I almost didn't say. That's one of the possible last endings. So thank you. Okay, so you can go to the next slide. Okay, this is um, a bench that I sat on for some time while I was <laughs> taking all my notes. And on the left, uh, there is Self-Care Sunday. And in the middle of the long wall is the um, heart of the home, which I previously talked about. So this next poem, um, I was really thinking about um, rest and self-care and innocence and paradise. And yeah. Uh, there's a couple of pieces that to me speak about that. So you can go to the next slide also, yeah. This one here um, is a zoom in of Self-Care Sunday and then you can go to the next one. Uh, we have Return to Paradise on the left right next to Angel on my bedside. And then the last slide is the two of them closer, just some close up so that we can really look at the interaction of like the theme of this work in Billy's work, right? This resting. Okay, so then we can go back to the one at the front. Thank you, Nia, for being my PowerPoint aficionado assistant. I really, really appreciate you. This is so helpful. Um, 
This one's also untitled, uh, but maybe, maybe something will come of it today and I'll get a title. I dreamt about mama on the beach again, about floating off to sea and looking back to see her just there lounging. Or was it standing on the shoreline, hand to brow, squinting into the horizon to make sure she saw me bobbing out there somewhere? I still don't know if it was real, but it was felt. What does it mean to feel paradise? To know it in an embodied sense and a spiritual heart, like the warm sun on your neck, the gentle push of a breeze, the sounds of home vibrating around you. What does it mean to return to a paradise lost? To show up on the Nile shores and find it has been destroyed. Piles of burning rubber where memories once lived. Closed fences around Hosh Abuk and a strange sense that the porch will never be open to the street again. What does it mean to seek a paradise lost knowing that both home and paradise don't have a location fixed in space, but are rather moving parts in this diaspora puzzle? What does it mean to make paradise wherever you are and knowing that it too will be lost in the time, but to not cling to this outcome Instead, wrestle with the process, collaborate on its creation, and maybe have some fun along the way. What does it mean to seek joy and rest and paradise for Black people at the end of times? How will it feel? And what will it look like? I imagine moments of freedom, strung together like prayer beads that I offer to the ocean. I imagine no prisons or police or military, just vibes. I imagine everyone I love in one place, even just briefly. I imagine running water and loud birds and a dry breeze. I imagine self-care Sunday every day and angels at my bedside. And I imagine you, I imagine you. Thank you. And that's my last piece. And so, um, yeah, Angels on My Bedside, maybe I didn't mention which one that one was, but that was the red, the red one that was on the right in the previous slide. Yeah, here we go. That's Angels on My Bedside. She spoke to me. Um, okay, so the last thing I want to say with these few images is I've just really, really appreciated working with Billy's work. Um, you know, it got me really thinking a lot about memory, which is something I already think about, but also like the fragments of memory and uh, the fragility of memory and materials that we use to like express that and methods. Um, and I, I always am just really appreciating to work with Africans who are on the continent. And so shout out to Billy as being a South African Malawian artist. Um, and again, shout out to y'all for holding me in vulnerability as I offer these uh, improvisational embodied pieces that have not been fully worked out. Thank you to the MOAD for offering me lots of opportunities time and time again. And uh, thank you to Nia for taking this picture two years ago uh, at the MOAD when things were open <laughs> in the world. So uh, yeah. Thank you so much, Shaw, for all of those pieces and your thoughtful as ever. I so appreciated hearing all of the backstory, the actual experience of seeing the art in person, um, the text that you read um, while you were doing this process, what it's been like to write these. Um, so we have a few minutes for more dialogue and I think people would love to hear um, more about this process. Um, so I would invite people in our audience to either put your questions in the chat and I'll read them out loud, or um, if you would like, you can raise your hand and I will call your, your name out and you can ask your question directly to Shaw. Um, let's see, we have a question in the chat. Um, love the feel of your poetry. Since the words are powerful, why did you choose to use the N word in your first piece? I'm muted. Oh, thank you. Good question. Um, let's see. I I think a lot about Blackness in my work and how it travels, right? And as a Black person living in America, 
Um, I feel like that word is reclaimed and reclaimable by some folks if they so choose. And so I've chosen to put it in these beautiful framings uh, of poetry and softness and flowers and love, because uh, that's how I feel about my niggas. <laughs> yeah. Um, and as more people come up with questions, please do again, put them in the chat or raise your hand. Um, I was thinking about something as you were reading, Shaw, you were talking about this process of your works and like how vulnerable it feels to share things early on. Can you speak to what your process is in terms of, I know poets kind of hate this question, but like, what is, what, how does it feel when you know a poem's done? Oh, good question. I mean, when it gets published, that's a, that's a <laughs> little bit of a joke because no, so few of them do. Um, it's not really, it's not really ever done for me. I feel like every time I read a poem, um, it's a little bit remixed and that's kind of like my philosophy. And so I have a script, you know, I have what's written, but then as I speak it out loud, sometimes different things jump out to be repeated or emphasized. Sometimes certain lines get tweaked. Um, and sometimes I make those tweaks permanent and then that becomes like a new version of the poem. Um, and if it was already somewhere, then it, that's the version that exists in the world too. So I have some poems, I have one poem that's like 10 years old that I still love to read, but I definitely don't read the version that is published in Kanja. <laughs> uh, yeah, so when is it done? I don't know, did I answer that? I don't think so, but it's never done. That, yeah, that's the classic answer, it's never done. <laughs> So, but I, it's, 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 I like hearing from poets what that process is like um, and what signals to you. And like, I can totally relate to that experience of revisiting pieces and then craft, be, they become new poems in a way with time, with different types of care. Um, and every time I read, I'm a slightly different person. So it is gonna come out a little bit different, right? Exactly. Um, Yeva has a question, um, whether or not you will do more ekphrastic work. You know what? The answer is yes. Yes. Because I didn't realize it, but I kind of already do, but just not poetically. So I've written in response to artwork a lot already. I'm published in the Black Aesthetic season two, which I believe is sold out. Um, but also I've worked with Umber and I've just, I've written a lot about like the Black woman is God and certain other exhibits and cinemas. Um, but I haven't necessarily sat down and like intentionally put down a poem um, to like on a sort of uh, responsive in, in a timeline um, with, you know, external demands. Like if something strikes me to write about, then that's what I do. So it was very different to write it when I'm like, I got to get over to Moad and sit down in the space and really enjoy it and be present and then revisit it. Um, but I love it. And I think I'm definitely going to include more of this type of poetry in my uh, critical writing of art too. So we'll see. Yeah, that's great. And I know that you had also talked about wanting to see more of the artwork. So I'm excited to see and hear the, the future poetry that you write based on more of the exhibits as well. I got to come back and go to the third floor. <laughs> There's all so, this so much more up there, right? And then uh, I'll see y'all at the community reading that's yeah. going to happen in two weeks and hopefully mm -hmm. we'll something new. That is a, a great plug, actually. So this series, we have two more weeks. Um, next Thursday, the 17th of February, we will have Ronaldo V. Wilson um, reading. So I highly encourage everyone to join us for that program. Um, we'll be dropping information about that um, in the chat. Um, it will also be on Zoom. So please jo do join us. And then we are anticipating that our final group reading, um, which will be on February 24th, will actually be at MOAD. So we invite you all to join us in our, our physical space in the company of these beautiful exhibitions. And it'll be really such a treat because all six of our poets who participated in this series, including Yeva, shout out, thank you for being here, um, will be reading um, together. And so we really hope that you join us for that. Um, and yes, we will be recording the program um, as well for folks who are unable to make it. Um, and we can definitely share that out afterwards. Um, all of our programs, including the previous readings from this series, are on MOAD's YouTube channel, so I invite you to go view those as well. Um, and we do have lots of programming coming up in addition to this series, so please do visit our website, which is moadsf.org, and you can find out information about all of our programs coming up, all of our exhibitions that are on view. They'll be up through the end of this month, um, through the 27th. 
Um, and finally, we do love your engagement um, and your support of MOAD. So we invite you to become a member, continue to come into these programs. If you are able to financially support, we do appreciate that as well. We um, accept donations through our website or also via phone. You can text the number 56512 and type MOAD SF um, and that will allow you to help support us um, in continuing these wonderful programs. Um, and lastly, lastly, we do appreciate your, your feedback. And so we'll share a quick program survey um, for you to share your thoughts. So we know all the, all the programming to continue. Um, so thank you again, Shaw, for this lovely conversation, for your poetry, for the photos. Um, I'm very much looking forward to hearing more of the work. Um, and thank you all for being an active audience and joining us in this conversation. So hope to see you again next Thursday and the following Thursday as well. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone.